Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Um, for our first conversation, we'll be speaking with a public affairs analyst, Mr. Chukuma Okenwa, who's on standby. Good morning, Mr. Okenwa. Yeah, good morning. So our, our conversation really is about um, open grazing in the southern part of Nigeria and all the controversy that this really seems to have generated um, with a focus on the southeast. Um, I'd like us to first get your um, perception. How do you really see this issue regarding the president's speech on reviving grazing routes in the country, southern governors coming together to um, put out laws to say open grazing is banned, and how really um, the people in the southeast and even those of the north are perceiving it? It is clear that uh, under the Land Use Act, the trust of who oversees and all holds the lands in honor of the state, its requisites on the governors, is depleted on the governors and not on the federal government. And as well, the governors are the chief security officers of their state. When you look at the incident of uh, open grazing, the Marudin uh, Fulani headsmen, and of course with their cows, the way they parade, not just in the rural communities, but in the state capital, like sometimes obstruct, obstructing vehicular movements, and not just that. We sometimes see like Fulani headsmen parade our communities with AK-47. And then you begin to tell me, if someone is actually there for such kind of purpose, your, your only interest is, of course, should have been to take care of your cows and to, you know, coexist peacefully with your host communities. But that does not happen. We have a case where host communities are oppressed and farms are, damages, are damaged. And the interesting thing is that when people reach out, host communities reach out to the police, they do nothing about that. It seems that there is a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. So I see it that this current move, you know, of from the southern governors to place a ban permanently on open grazing was well advised and was also commendable to know that many of them have already complied. And we, particularly in Enugu, we are very, very excited about this recent move. Okay, so now let's let's focus on the Enugu perspective. Uh, I think it was in the news yesterday that uh, the governor, uh, Ifan Gwai, has you know passed that bill and of course signed. Um, how much of a challenge was it in Enugu? And do you think that it, it is you know a perfect timing, um, or it could have come earlier? Well, we expected it to have come earlier, uh, but then uh, it's better late than never, uh, because. Considering the demand of our governor, like most of us know him, he doesn't talk much. You know, we, he seemingly, you can you can't can sometimes understand from his body language what may likely be his response in an issue like this, being that he's very peaceful. He believes in coexistence, peaceful coexistence with other part of the country. And so for a very sensitive issue like this, but most importantly, in the interest of the people that he is leading, he just have to do this, and the people are very, very excited with this current move. It is commendable, it is laudable, and personally, I say kudos to the governor of Enugu State, and I would also expect him to act with this level of courage in some other issues that affect the Southeast at the moment. Okay, so regarding this open grazing situation in the Southeast, um, We've seen, you know, news reports saying basically that governors in the southeast have been stalling regarding this when you compare it to, you know, governors in the southwest. But, you know, one of the governors who have gone ahead to pass this is the Abia state government. And uh, the, on the flip side, people's concerns have been implementation. That beyond passing this anti-open grazing bills into law, does the state government really have the authority to go ahead and enforce this, this law to make sure that, you know, people who are grazing cattle or who are, you know, roaming with their cattle cannot do that freely anymore. So let's talk about the commitments and the authority, the political will of these governors to follow through with those laws. As a matter of fact, I expect our governors to be not only proactive, but very assertive. It really pays. Let me give you an instance. Just three meetings of the southern governors, the foundation of the country is already shaking. Because over the time, it appeared that nothing has 
tend to see the Southerners as tenants and themselves as the landlord. Now, you can see what is happening with the VAT issue. That is assertiveness. Everything in life can be negotiated. If the constitution said that you are the chief security officer of your state and the chief executive officer of your state, you don't need anybody, you don't need anyone to like help, you know, you know, inspire you to work to function optimally in that position. The Nigerian police force is not just uh, an issue of the federal government, it belongs to including the state governors. And they should be proactive. Whoever is in charge of the state command is called a commissioner. You have other commissioners under you as a governor, commissioner for housing, commissioner for budget, commissioner for youth and sports. And same thing with the commissioner of police. He must not be treated as someone that is higher than the state. And this issue of like maybe waiting to ratify instruction from the OGA at the top, from the IGDP, GDP, from the IGP, it's even unconstitutional. It ought not to be so because in the police council, you have the president, you have the vice president, you have the IGA, you have the Tarsis governors. So even in the voting, if the governors have been very proactive and insist that the Nigerian police force will work, I tell you the simple truth, it will work. But over time, they have not even able to utilize the provisions of the constitution. They have not been assertive enough. We've always had this situation where elected officers will begin to act as if to say they are appointed by the president. I mean, they should be able to rise to the occasion and say, we are the chief security officers of our state. The, the, the police is the tool for governance at every level, and it has to work to protect every citizen. It is an institution that is constituted by the constitution and should not even be under the purview or maybe like a, 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 a caprices and whims of any politician. If the president even is to order the police around, it must be within the ambits of the law. That's what makes you know a, a, a nation that is governed by the rule of law. The law is greater than everybody, even the person of Mr. President. Everybody should abide by the rule of the law. All right. Um, also speak, you know, with regards how this, you know, can be enforced without necessarily destroying the relationship. Um, because you mentioned, you know, that uh, Enugu State in particular has, or the governor himself rather, has, you know, continued to, you know, encourage a peaceful relationship, um, you know, amongst people there. And every now and then we share stories of, um, you know, the Mieti ally in Enugu State, um, you know, in government house addressing uh, the governor, you know, and trying, to, you know, to mend fences and some of all of that. So how do you think that this can be enforced without necessarily creating friction between those relationships um, and ensuring, you know, that, you know, every part of the Southeast remains peaceful, um, mostly because of the narrative that has been spewed by certain characters, seeing this as an attack on Northerners, an attack on Fulani headers. Earnestly, respect is a broker. You can recall that before the, this, the governor went ahead to pass the, the, the you know, to sign this uh, the bill into law. He invited uh, uh, the, the Tatuweras and told them this is the plan of the state. And they said you should give them 30 days. You can imagine that. Those who are hosted in your state, trying to order the state around. So there is no way when someone is oppressive in the mindset, if you want to really tackle issue, you won't get to the point of calling a spade a spade and not a family implement. I believe that the Northerners know what they are doing. They are treating the southern, southern part of the country for a right. And I tell you, this oneness we've always wanted, this oneness we've always negotiated for, it will be solidified, it will be, it will be stronger when every region will have a voice, when everybody is equal stakeholder in the same Nigeria, when every one of us are treated as co-owners of this one nation and not a situation where the South is oppressed, you know, people are dying in silence and all the rest of it, and then we can't pretend any longer the unity of Nigeria, it stands up for negotiation, and the only way to go about it, the essence of having Eastern laws, provision of law, is to ensure peaceful coexistence. That can only happen when there is fairness, equity, and justice, and that is all that the South is demanding for, and the time is right and ripe. And kudos to all the southern governors. I'm looking forward to the next meeting in November. If they have always spoken all the while from the beginning of this country, this the southern part of the country will not be as marginalized as it is. The southern part of the country has always subsidized the north in everything in terms of the resources. It's interesting to note that uh, the, 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 why, why they talk about you know how much uh, how many percentage should go to the south host communities and all the rest of it nobody is talking about the gold in zamfara it's still completely a northern property 
we cannot continue in, 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 in a false federalism that does not, you know, you know, respect the quality of all stakeholders. We must call a spade a spade and not a family implement. And once that is done, everybody will be happy collaborating, coexisting in one Nigeria. Okay, I want us to talk about what's happening in Anambra State. They seem to have a gentleman's agreement where, you know, if there's any clash between farmers and herders, whoever is, you know, thought to be responsible will pay compensation. The governor has ordered some farmers to pay compensation to some, you know, cattle herders and asked cattle herders to pay compensation to some farmers. And that's how they've been doing it. Do you think that system works? For how long will they continue to pay money? Would payments, you know, be um, enough restitution for loss of lives, loss of farmlands, um, loss of harvest, lots of cattle? And would you say the Anambra State government is maybe jeopardizing the efforts of the southeastern governors and governors in the south as a, as a, as a whole who have decided to collectively ban open grazing? I have a problem with his, the way he is going about that. And as a matter of fact, when you see state actors begin to act as non-state actors, why seek for alternative ways of this resolution when you, as a state actor, can actually initiate laws that will not only uh, ensure that you know, there is a legitimacy of enforcement, but also the sustainability of that policy? What happens when he leaves office in the, in the next few months to come? So he should be able to look at the sustainability. And over the time, when you also say, like, we, we, you know, when, when you destroy things and all the rest of it, invariably we are making provisions for some of those clashes. But when it is very clear, you know, it's interesting to know that both herders and those that cultivate are collectively farmers. They are in one sector, they are in agriculture. But one is already suffocating the other. How will the herders be suffocating the farmers. Over time, we've tried to be nice to call it farmers headers clash. But what we've seen, it can be a clash where you have one group fully armed, oppressing the other, and interesting to note, in their community. We are not talking about the southern, maybe those from southeast going there to like, maybe, you know, maybe they have a ranch, and you are trying to like, convert the ranch into farm. Would that even be, be, be thought for? Can that happen in Nigeria? Maybe I live from, from Enugu to go to Kanu, see a farm there, maybe, maybe a ranch, if there is anyone there, and start cultivating. If it is that there is no alternative to maybe open grazing, it would have been an issue. But this alternative is something that is consistent with global best practices. You don't allow Nama, you don't allow cow to be moving everywhere. I mean, in a civilized society, what sort of thing is this? We should have moved past this. Where other nations are talking about Internet of Things, talking about 5G, talking about you know you know electric vehicles, talking about automating their, their systems fully. Nigeria is still talking about rediscovering open grazing routes. That is far 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 backward. And I mean, we can't be talking about having this conversation in the 21st century. All right. Before we move on to discussing you know all the challenges uh, in the southeast, I, I I want us to also speak. Um, uh, with regards, uh, my colleague already brought up uh, Anambra State, but let's move to Imo State and discuss this, you know, across party lines now. The governor of Imo, Hopo um has been accused of, you know, dragging his feet and also maybe not even so interested in the anti-open grazing law. Um, so do, do you all, do you see this as, you know, him, of course, being the uh, um, chief security officer of the state, you know, knowing what is best for his state and maybe not being interested in banning open grazing or, you know, being, you know, a, a member of the APC and not wanting to go against um, his party's wishes? Well, Hope Osadema has been clearly disconnected from his people, right from the voting process, because no one explains, yes, we have to respect uh, the Supreme Court uh, justice. But largely in the South is we see him as the Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Court governor. Because for someone to move from fourth position to first position, there is no mathematics, there is no law anywhere that will explain that. But that aside, it is also very visible that what mo most of the kind of times like decisions that he is always taking shows a strong disconnect. He is not interested in connecting with the people. What stops you as a governor when you reach out to the state house of assembly? 
State House of Assembly should be able to consult with their people through town hall meetings to find out will this in any way represent their interests. And if it does, what is governance if it's not all about people? I mean, what you hold, you hold in trust for your people. You are governing today because the people supposedly, you know, voted for you. Every government derives its legitimacy from the support of the people. And when you are doing things and you don't consider that, this whole thing has uh, leave its relevance in the southeast, the open grazing. It's caused lots of problems. Lives has been lost. Women has been defied and all the rest of it. Then why would anyone want to pretend that it's not helping? So I think he's trying to play the, the politically correct uh, uh, card, which it's not sustainable, it's not helpful, and it's gradually losing its popularity before his people. You can gather with the southern governors. You collectively agree in a thing. You didn't object only to come and be the stranger in the midst of your brethren, seeking for the interest of the region. Because it is when we come together as, don't forget that Nigeria coming together. We came in together as a Southern Protectorate and the Northern Protectorate. And there were rules that were set for engagement. And I believe if we can respect ourselves and come together, then certainly the unity can be sustainable. All of these agitations will be put right into the bag. Mr. Okinwa, I want us to analyze this ban on open grazing vis-a-vis -vis security networks in the southeast and the southwest. In the southwest, there's the Amoteco. It's the original security outfit there. And in the news in recent time, we've heard stories of Amoteco, even you know, a few days ago, arresting herders that were found in their communities. And I saw um, just this week, um, they also seized about 53 cows so we can see that in the southeast, the Amoteku as, as a security instrument has been, you know, active in trying to enforce the ban on open grazing. But we don't have such in the southwest. There's the um, Ebubagu, but we don't hear stories about them taking action on this, you know, grazing ban in the state. So would you suggest that that's something they should look into? Because, like I mentioned earlier, beyond passing the bills, you know, into law, the, the, the crux of the matter should be about enforcement. I mean, when Governor of Abia State was actually asked regarding um, implementation of the ban on open grazing, what he told the media was that they should go and ask the police why they're not enforcing the ban. So it seems like in the Southwest, you know, they don't have it together regarding governors pointing fingers to the police, the police pointing fingers to the governors. But in the South, Southwest, on the other hand, the Amoteku, um, you know, seems to be doing something about it. Well, let me say something. I'm one of those that believe that before even ever thinking of making like, okay, finding other alternatives, getting other security networks, we should be able to rejig the police force, motivate the police force, invest into it, give them all of their place to enforce the law, remind them of their responsibilities, and insist that they act in accordance to the police act. Because what we see like it's a police that, I mean, uh, it's like somebody even we want to arrest someone that you don't like the face, you want to negotiate for someone to be, you know, criminalized, you, you, you reach out to the police force. So it's not only the, the federal government that is abusing the police force. We've seen the police, you know, even when you go to some stations, you see uh, bail is free, right? But who is checking those things? Even the state governors will stay under their state. Police will collect money. Is it the federal government also that allow them to be collecting money? I think the governors has really been very passive as, as regards to making the police force work. Having said that, in Enugu State, we have uh, uh, the Forest Guard, right? I am sure that since the Ebubago literally failed on arrival because of the security sabotage of some of these governors, they never wanted it to work because you want to set out a security outfit, there is no level of investment, no fund that is assigned. How will that work without funding? I mean, the whole thing was dead on arrival. So we expect them to insist because the simple truth is that if you create even state police without actually ensuring that the federal police works or that the Nigerian police, let me not call, not call it federal police. Of course, it is the Nigerian police force. And Nigeria is not just Abuja. It's not just the FCT. It includes the Tar six states. And interestingly, all the Tar six states governors are part of the police council. 
So let them decide that this police council will meet. That will probably be like maybe once in seven years that they decide to meet or whatever. They have not been meeting. Let them meet and let the governors present the ideas and say, see, over the time, it appeared that the police has just been a federal government issue. Now we want every one of us to be co-stakeholders in the same police force. Don't forget, life is all about negotiation. Nobody gives you a space. You have to take your space. So I want the state governors to take their space in terms of resource control. I'm happy with all that is happening in the respect to VAX. Let all the governors put their voices together. We can't afford in a true federal system to have a, an all-powerful center and weak subnationals. That is not consistent with what we call a federal system. If we have a unitary system, let's call it so. If we have a federal system and want to practice democracy, let's call it so. And not for pretending this has limited Nigeria. And when you look at all of the indices, Nigeria keep moving down as a country. I'm not talking about maybe like press statement by the opposition party. I'm talking about when you look at the indices for assessment on the global scale, whether on the one by the World Bank, several indices they release, or the one by Transparency International, or the E-Development Index recently released by Commonwealth, all of these global agencies, Nigeria has not fared well, and we don't need the opposition party to tell the current administration that things are not working well. Even the, right, the, 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 the man on the street knows that things are not the way it ought to be. You know, there is that inflation all of the time, you know, at skyrocketing percentages for salaries are not increasing, Minimum wage is not even implemented in some states. So how will the common man cope? But we've not seen the government cut down on the large expenses invested in governing the country. In fact, the people are suffering, but government at all levels has a mark for themselves, hardship allowance. These things ought not to be so. The citizens are doing the suffering that they are enjoying the hardship allowances. All right, um, so, okay, okay well, I, I now want us to move to talking about some other you know, uh, thing entirely. Um, I believe you're currently in Enugu State. Yes, I am. Um, so it, it, what is the current situation on ground there? Is there movement? Because today apparently is the 17th, and there was a notice by the IPOB earlier this week that Monday, Tuesday, and Friday would be sit at home. So can you share with us you know, what the current situation is on, in Enugu State? Yeah. Okay, like, uh, interestingly, before now, I've, I've drove around the city, major places, you know, uh, shared like a, a live video assuring people that normalcy is gradually returning to the city. I think I saw about 25% vehicle than what's the vehicular movement uh, was. But I think many persons are still like, um, you know, uh, wondering, is it safe to move? Because of course, let's not forget that even for like about last three weeks, after we must have observed it two times, the leadership of IVOB came and, 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 and said that this instruction was not coming for us for a continued sit at home. But interestingly, we didn't hear from the government reassuring the citizen that maybe their safety is intact and all the rest. We saw even government offices locked down on such days. You know, but in the interesting thing is people are not tired, of course, like this month, this week, week we've been on, on lockdown on Monday and on Tuesday. And then even this Friday, people are wondering, do we really come out? And government is not saying anything about that. And I think it's really high time for governors in the Southeast to become more assertive, more proactive. We shouldn't be getting instruction of what to do from non-state actors. We should be getting instruction from the leaders that we elected, because one of the things that is very shocking when I try to imagine, during the period of the COVID-19 lockdown, when governors were in 16, people should stay home. I mean, it was a battle, it was a fight. You could literally see people disobeying that rule. But IPOP says everybody should sit at home, and there was maximum compliance, largely due to three reasons. Some stood in solidarity with the embattled the, uh, Nandekano. Some others were sitting at home, largely because of fear. I can tell you over 80% of persons were not sure that the government will secure them. And of course, uh, uh, the third was simply because the vehicles, commuters, which were largely co controlled by that network, were also not available. So there was no way you could actually go out, go to work or anywhere. Okay, so um, back to the issue about the open grazing in the Southeast. The Southeast town unions um, disclosed to newsmen that they would protest against governors in the Southeast who have a pay lip service to the ban on open grazing. Um, 
We've also seen in the news um, residents of so many states in the southeast, including Anambra, saying that the, gov the governor needs to do more than just, you know, pay, pay money um, to farmers or herders who are involved in any clash that in involves loss of lives. So if a protest like this happens, how do you see it playing out? Do you see the government of those states that seem to be stalling, um, you know, take this more seriously? Or do you expect what we see when people gather to protest? The police clamp down on those groups. I clamp down on your people. Protests, of course, would be the only alternative if dialogue doesn't work. Because I mean, you should be able to listen to your people. This thing has cost lots, Rex, correct? Um, Lots of half work in the southeast. So protests should be seen as maybe the last option. I would ask all of the town unions to explore the option of dialogue, first of all. And if the governors wouldn't listen, right, then they should be able to do something. But let me tell you the simple truth. It is sad to note at the moment, visibly from what we've seen, that IPOP leadership is more powerful than all the southeast governors put together. And I've called on them before now to go on a leadership retreat and ask them, say, why did you lose it? How come we've lost our relevance? How come the sword has lost its saltiness to the point that when we assure our people to go back to work and do everything, you know, non-state actors. So I'm also thinking that if I Bob tells them, maybe you have to, you know, ensure that this become a law. I'm sure that those governors that are visibly afraid, wow. because the interesting thing also is that some of the governors have their government houses now barricaded. You understand? Mm -hmm. What is the pressure you are creating in the mind of people that work freely about without the police, without the military and all the rest of it? You are confirming to them that these securities are in your state. And how did they come about? How come when you now have an opportunity to address it, you are not addressing it? It's a question, it's a food for thought for our Saudis governors. Interesting one there, Mr. Chukuma. Okay, well, that statement you made that the IPOB is more powerful than the Southeast leadership, I believe that's something they should think about and find solutions to as soon as possible. Um, thank you very much. Once again, public affairs analyst based in Enugu Chukuma, Okinawa, um, for sharing your thoughts with us regarding the open grazing ban in the southeastern part of Nigeria. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, stay with us. Uh, we'll move away from the southeast and now talk about Nigeria's uh, current debt profile and the president's call for another $4.9 billion loan. Uh, we'll be joined by an economist, Ken Ife, right after the short break. Stay with us.